a really big influence on your calcium availability is where you're sourcing it and what the source is. So we utilize our limestone from ILC in Iowa, I believe. Okay. Um, and we use the same batch for the whole study because even your batching can differ sure. on the solubility levels. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, where we bring you the latest in poultry nutrition research and industry trends. My name is Sam Rochel. I'm one of the co-hosts of the podcast, uh, joining from uh, Auburn University. And uh, today I'll be talking with a graduate student who I've kind of known over the years uh, through conferences and different interactions, uh, Cheris Waters uh, at Mississippi State University. She's uh, midway through her her PhD program and uh, going to talk to us a little bit about some of the laying in uh, work. So thanks for joining, Cheris. I, I look forward to the conversation today. And I know you've done uh, like some work on, on laying hens, particularly looking at calcium uh, supplementation and, and uh, laying hens. Can you can you look uh, walk us through kind of the, the design of the research we're going to discuss today and the, the approach you've taken? Absolutely. Yes. So um, for my master's program, um, I was very interested in the research for limestone particle size and different inclusion, as well as that phytase supplementation as they go hand in hand. And so for that study, um, we had it broken down into two phases. We had our post-peak production and late lay. And so we'll really talk about the post-peak production uh, today. But what that looked like was a 40 to 60 week trial. So 20 weeks total. Mm -hmm. Um, And those birds, again, were entering their post-peak production. So they were kind of on the downside of uh, their hen day egg production um, and kind of what that looked like. Um, So for that study, we utilized uh, incomplete block design with seven treatments. And we Mm -hmm. had two factors. Um, The two factors included uh, limestone ratios at a 60-40 uh, coarse and fine ratio, and then a 15, an 85, 15. So 85 coarse, 15 fine. Um, and the second factor looked at different inclusion levels of phytase. And so we had zero FTUs, 400 FTUs, which we used as our standard, and then a 1500 FTUs, which we used as our higher inclusion of phytase. Um, and so that's kind of what that looked like. We had 560 laying hens, again, at the post peak of their production. Um, and from there, we just monitored daily hen day egg production. We had a pretty strict feeding schedule of um, 100 grams of feed per bird per day. So that was pretty mm-hmm. intense, but it was very sure. insightful. Um, And then we looked at our egg quality every five weeks just to kind of measure um, any impacts that those factors had. Um, And then from there, at the end of that phase, we looked at an ocetal breakdown from the gizzard and ileum. We looked at bone health through micro CT structure, as well as standard bone ash and bone breaking strength. So that's kind of just a big overview of what this really uh, long 20 week study looked like. Okay, great. Yeah, a lot of work, uh, a lot of actual farm labor feeding these birds, and then, you know, a comprehensive set of measurements, which I know that when you do a trial like this, you want to collect all the data you can to get a complete picture and really uh, get the best ROI for what it takes to run these types of laying in experiments, which not many people are doing. So really appreciate your, your efforts on that. Um, so you mentioned one of the main factors was the, the particle size on the different proportions of the, the coarse and the fine. Were those, your coarse and fine, were those uh, different limestone sources or was that the same limestone source that you altered the particle size on? Great question. So a really big influence on your calcium availability is where you're sourcing it and what the source is. So we utilize our limestone from ILC in Iowa, I believe. Okay. Um, and we use the same batch for the whole study because even your batching can differ sure. on the solubility levels. So we use the same batch of uh, bone and shell builder, so our coarse limestone, which was around, it was between two to four millimeters in size. And then we used uh, a Unical M, I believe, which is a really fine um, particle size. Um, it's between zero and two millimeters. So those were the um, particle sizes, and we use this the same batch for the whole study. So we could minimize any influence from batching. Yeah. Makes sense. So, so you've got those with the different levels of phytase supplementation. So, I mean, what were the, the key uh, 
findings of these different treatments on egg quality production and those types of things. We had lots of very interesting uh, interactions, some main effects for both phytase and limestone. So for our interaction, we could see um, Hinde egg production was significantly impacted Mm -hmm. for both um, limestone and phytase. So we saw that a ratio 40 to 60 at either zero or 400 FTUs, uh, we saw an increase in Hinde egg production of about a percent which is pretty major, especially when you're looking at the lifespan of a bird. For those interactions, uh, we really saw a big impact on Hinde egg production in which uh, limestone ratio 40 to 60 at either zero or 400 FTUs increased Hinde egg production of about a percent, which a percent doesn't seem like a lot in the grand scheme of things. But if you look at the production of the whole bird, 1% for the whole cycle, especially of a post-peak stage is pretty major, especially for a producer. And um, we could possibly contribute this to the impact of um, calcium within the bird at that time. Um, It could be due to imbalances or malabsorptions from those sources. And studies have shown that if imbalances occur, especially for calcium, it could influence um, pituitary glands. And so that can influence the luteinizing hormone or follicle stimulating hormone so that they're not reaching that maturity as quick. So they're not going to produce um, those follicles in time to have a, a egg a day type situation. So that's what we saw for Hinde egg production, which was pretty interesting. Yeah, very nice. And so what about on the, um, you know, the, the effects of phytase? So we know that, you know, super dosing or higher levels of phytase is pretty common. What, what did you see that or how did you see that impact, you know, performance, the inositol breakdown, bone quality and, the, and those measurements? So overall, we did not see what we anticipated to see for our superdose level, especially whenever you look at broiler studies, you see these major, major benefits um, whenever you include, include a superdose. And with laying hens, we're not quite sure what that superdose level is at this time. We have um, other studies being conducted elsewhere, kind of looking into those higher levels. But for our 1500 FTUs, We didn't see any major significance for bone ash or bone breaking strength, but we did start to see a lot of influence due to uh, bone microstructure or micro CT. And so that's kind of a little bit more um, introspective when you're looking at the individual medullary, cortical, and trabecular bones. And then we also saw influence in bone mineral content. Um, And we saw that there was an increase in manganese and zinc. Um, And this Studies have shown within like fish that um, this mineral, these minerals can be liberated more whenever you include a higher level. And so we started to see those impacts, but nothing um, for like those typical uh, responses for bone ash or bone breaking strength. But we did start to see it on a micro CT level and even a mineral level, which could impact later on for late lay um, when they're past um, the 60 week period. So those could start to influence, but for our time period, we didn't start to see that um, within these 20 weeks. Proven on the farm, trusted on the plate, let our technologies help make your production goals a reality. Learn from the experts how carbohydrates can improve nutrient utilization, gut health technologies differ by type, and how liquid smoke can light your bird performance on fire. Carrie isn't just leading in animal agriculture, we're innovating it. Sense. And just to be clear, this was uh, the additional phytase was still at the same level of calcium and, and phosphorus, or was there any uh, adjustment in the, the levels to account for the higher phytase? We used uh, matrix credits to account for that extra phytase inclusion uh, okay. due to the liberation okay. of that phosphorus. Okay. And so we tried to make sure that each diet maintained the same um, available phosphorus and calcium um, throughout. So we did apply those credits to kind of help maintain similarity throughout those different treatments. Okay. So yeah, you did have a higher credit for the higher phytase compared with the 400. Okay. So, you know, a lot of work, um, a lot of uh, interesting uh, findings, you know, on different measurements with all this, you know, what would you say kind of your future recommendations around uh, particle size and and phytase? Do you you have any concrete recommendations based on, on your data? I don't have any concrete information, but I do think we're in the right direction of what we're looking at. Sure. Um, again, we're not 100% on what a superdose level is for laying hens right now. We're seeing that 400 or 1500 might not be 
what we consider a superdose level at this time. Um, so I do think additional research in looking at maybe higher levels um, for that phytase inclusion. And again, um, for inositol levels, we did see within the study that we had a higher breakdown of those lower esters mm -hmm. of IP4 and IP3s when we did provide 1500 FTUs, which is great. Um, so we could maybe kind of understand that, yes, it's breaking down those esters at a lower level, so you're liberating more phosphorus. And what could that mean for um, later uh, durations of 60 weeks to 80 week birds? And then we can also um, look at that limestone uh, ratio inclusion. So again, as those birds are aging, they're needing more coarse calcium in their diet so those eggshells can be properly formed during the dark hours or when they're not eating. And so maybe 85 uh, to 15 is, of course, to find is too much. So maybe it could be 80 or 70, which I believe in the management guide is a 70-30 when they're around 70 to 80 weeks. So maybe just looking at these two factors more specifically and maybe adjusting them in other studies to see if we do see the improvement we're looking for or if we're where we're needing to be at this time. No, it makes sense. I think you make a good point about, you know, not seeing some of the responses that, that you see in the literature around broilers with super dosing, because, you know, in that case, the, the, the bone growth and development is so rapid. And so they're so sensitive uh, whereas in the laying hens, you're, you're having these change in, in, in bone to supply the egg, but it's, it's certainly not as dramatic as in a immature bird and, and what you're seeing there. So um, I think it's, you know, you're doing important work on understanding uh, what to even look for. Um, and with this approach, you know, what measurements are going to be sensitive and, and how you can really track and determine what is the, the optimum level of, of a phytase in laying hen. So I think it's very, very valuable. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, hey, thanks again uh, for joining. Uh, look forward to uh, hearing more about the work that you're doing. Uh, we were just talking before we uh, started the recording that, that we'll see each other at uh, IPSF here in a couple of weeks uh, after the time of this recording. So I uh, hope to learn more about what you're doing, uh, doing there. So thanks again for your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I've I'm very excited to share this information with everyone. Thanks to all of you for listening uh, to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I uh, want to catch future similar episodes. Uh, please like or subscribe on, on the platforms uh, that you're listening to us on. And until next time. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.